our next talk is um, from Brian Dickman and Joe Convey of Silicon Insights Limited. Uh, they're independent consultants, and they're going to talk about mobilizing your data to drive predictable verification. Um, Brian Dickman uh, has spent several decades uh, engineering teams in the development on verification of complex hardware IP at ARM. I'll cut these a bit short because I want to give you your time. And John Convey has spent nearly 20 years in semiconductor and, and EDA, a senior leader helping semiconductor clients mobilize their engineering data to improve IP quality and deliverable uh, delivery predictability. Thanks Shortly very much, fit. Mike. And it's actually Joe Convey. Brian's over there. Okay. And uh, when we received the invite, we saw the uh, early version of the uh, the draft agenda and it had challenges on there. So we're about challenges today. We're not quite sure when Mike sent it out, if we meant we were the challenge, Brian and I, or uh, doing this presentation. So we went with the latter interpretation, which is we want to challenge you guys. We've only got 15 minutes and we're two up, so uh, let's get cracking. But as you can see from the title there, our challenge to you today is um, do you mobilize data in order to get predictable verification? Okay, so you've seen from Andy's presentation the uh, evolving world of verification. I think we're, our challenge is um, slightly more basic, let's put it that way, but fundamental uh, to you guys uh, today. So let's, uh, let's get on with it then. So I guess the problem we're trying to solve is the age old dilemma of uh, not done yet, completeness on the one hand. And then the other side, the overwhelming drive from sales and marketing, the executive board to get ready, get fast, move quicker so we can get to revenue the fastest possible way. Um, and with that comes the question mark about investment in verification. So how much money has been invested by the company to achieve the results um, required? Um, and that not, not yet done, is uh, quite a, a driver, as we all know. Um, and on the other side, building a business case based on good information to go to executive management and say, we need to invest more in the right sort of things, tackle some of the challenges that Andrew was just talking about, um, uh, is a really difficult thing to do. Um, and getting that uh, balance right is what we're all about. So I guess you need insights in order to make good reasoning good reasoning into uh, decision making and that's uh, what we'd like to address. So let's talk a little bit about how you uh, go about doing that. So in order to get to the glorious position where you can make reasoned evidence decisions on what to do next, and you're talking about how to continuously improve your verification process, you need really good insights. And our observation looking at um, uh, companies in the industry is that that's not always the case. And um, a lot of companies uh, are failing, we would say, to actually start from the bottom of the pyramid here, which is to understand the nature of data that needs to be captured in order to do an outstanding job of verification, to get there faster, to get better results. So our contention is the value goes up as you go up the pyramid there from collecting data. So what are the data sources you have at your command? What actually do you collect? We'll come on to that shortly. Um, you got the data engineering bit in the middle there, but critically, what analytics can you uh, extract from that? So the quality of the analytics that you're able to lay your hands on is a critical determinant of being able to be successful with verification challenge. And ultimately, as you go up the chain there, or the pyramid, should I say, uh, the value increases but it's really heavily predicated on getting stuff right at the bottom. So trying to understand, you might argue this a little bit simplistic, but we're trying to find a way that you could capture um, these two medium sized words with huge consequences, effectiveness and efficiency. So we put them in the form of a formula here to uh, demonstrate exactly perhaps what you should be looking at in terms of those two critical um, uh, areas, effectiveness and efficiency. So uh, if you think of those as variables within the formula, then obviously effectiveness is about uh, collecting bugs, finding where they are, bug yield, in other words, coverage, the number of test cycles required to actually achieve that, um, and the methodology, of course. 
efficiency. Um, we've all been in the position where we've seen um, uh, amazingly effective test bunches, which run like a dog because the platform you have is outdated, slow. Again, it's an investment question. What can you do to actually improve that? So there's an interplay between these two, of course, but getting these um, understood, going back to the data-driven uh, uh, insights we were just talking about, is entirely dependent on the data schema at the bottom of the page here. So each of those variables, if you want to analyze carefully and collect information um, to actually make decisions, you need to have a really good handle on that information. And our experience is talking with various customers we've worked with is that that information isn't always collected. And uh, we're going to come on to a couple of uh, slides in a minute here where we sort of challenge you in the audience to think about where you sit on, on the spectrum of levels of competence here. Uh, again, with the theme of trying to challenge you a little bit. But actually, data schema is the fundamental force here to actually getting good outcomes. So this is where we look around the room. And uh, as I describe this, I see uncomfortable shifting in seats as people self-identify from uh, level zero through to Nirvana that uh, you were discussing earlier on, partially achievable with ChatGPT today as we're hearing from Andy. So going through these um, levels here, we use this as a way of describing where people might be. Um, so have a look for yourselves. But um, left-hand side, they're black box. And we have come across companies which are in this category where actually they find it incredibly difficult to lay their hands on that information to make good decisions because they're not collecting the data in the first place. Very high risk from an exec management point of view and investors, because a number of small startups may find themselves in this category. That's black box. You can't make decisions easily. It's all flying by the seat of your pants um, and very uncomfortable for all involved. The next level up, obviously, spreadsheet based. A lot of people doing this, looking for shifting in their seats and comfortable body language. Um, Self-identify, please doesn't scale. And again, when it comes to being able to do this in an automated fashion, which is critical for scalability, thinking of small startups, et cetera, um, moving on from that level is critically important. If you want to get to a kind of sweet spot in the middle, whereby you've actually collected good data and automated the generation of analytics, then you're actually firing all, all cylinders. And that would put you in a very good position for continuous improvement. EDA is playing a critical role here. Um, if you think of it in terms of maximizing productivity, what can the EDA companies do to um, improve tooling with the assistance of ML? There's a good deal of discussion in marketing about AI, but actually read ML. And ML is based on good data. So once again, you come back to the inevitability of collecting the right data to do, to do the best job. Um, Andy was talking about AI, uh, largely unattainable for most people, I would say, at this stage, but certainly a goal that uh, we know EDA are looking at and some of the big tier one semis, uh, et cetera, will be well advanced in that uh, regard. But also as a, a research, if there are students in the room, a research um, item, that, that's something where we'd all like to be more successful. So those are the levels. Quick show of hands in a good democratic style in this year of democratic uh, elections around the world. Who would identify themselves at level two? Oh, there's a couple of uh, honest bods around the room. Very good, well done, it's not bad. Anyone to the left of level two? Anyone care to fess up to being, oh yeah, excellent, well done, yeah. Oh, uh, Andy, well, can I have a chat with you afterwards? <laughs> we might be able to help you. Uh, very good, well, so you can see the uh, scheme here. The idea is to actually really work out where you are and then do something about it. Thanks. Right, so I'm going to shut up in a second, but um, just a couple of other thoughts. I'll quickly do these. Um, culture. Have you got the right culture in your team to create the analytics, to actually go about collecting data? There's huge resistance from verification engineers to collecting voluminous data, as they would see it, to actually do a better job. Is your data engineering capability up to scratch? That's a key player here. And then do you have a credible system for collecting information? in the first place. Anyway, just a few thoughts for you there. Um, I'll pass you over to my colleague, Brian.
and he's going to talk in a bit more detail about some of the other issues. How many minutes has he left me, Mike? <laughs> okay. Oh. Okay. Um, well, it wouldn't be us if we didn't show you some graphs and some data. So, um, quick um, word of warning here. This is all fake data. It doesn't represent any companies we've worked for. It's not real data. It's all synthetic data. But Joe and I have found that actually building some uh, synthetic data is a valuable exercise because it allows us to try and articulate some of these scenarios to you um, and explain how you might be able to utilize data if you're collecting it. So uh, we've written a paper on this, actually, which we published on our website, um, predictable verification. And we're just going to walk you quickly through uh, a couple of scenarios here. So the first scenario, we call it the baseline scenario. Um, this is maybe what your data looks like. Um, but if it does, then you might, you might think you might uh, have a few problems with it. So uh, the, uh, the detail level on that chart are different phases of the project. So the green towards the, uh, the right-hand side of that chart would be your final, your final phase of the project. And in baseline scenario one, you can see that there's a lot of verification effort, uh, a lot of consumption going on in that very kind of late stage of the project. And we think that's a red flag because if you've got a big peak of activity there with a, sh you know, a sharp cutoff because you're making a release, there's a very good probability that you're also going to see a peak in the bug rate at that point as well. And if your bug rate is peaking, you know, roughly at the time that you're making a release, there's probably going to be some post-release effects as well. So the second scenario is what can you do then to improve that situation? And everybody talks about shift left. So we've got this shift left scenario. We've reduced that final stage and moved some of that effort into the pre-release testing phases. But we also think we've shifted down so it's shift left shift down we've reduced the overall cost to the project to deliver the same sort of quality so the overall cost to the project is less um but the the amount of cycles that you're running is more and you might have achieved that by improving the efficiency of your testing environment so if you improve the efficiency of test benches you could achieve that and that would be you know time and effort well spent there's a good reward for that um so if we look at the two more scenarios, um, you might say, well, actually, my issue isn't about so much the cost, it's the quality. I'm not finding all the bugs. So I'm going to spend the same amount of money on a more efficient test bench, and I'm just going to get more cycles in. I'm going to double the amount of testing that I'm doing for the same, for the same budget. So we call that the improved quality. And then the fourth one, is actually maybe you've got some real quality issues and actually you need to seriously scale up the amount that you're doing. So that's kind of the invest more. So it's still shift left, but you're spending a lot more money on resources to achieve you know, that, higher, that higher quality level. Um, so how many people in this room uh, would say they're doing you know, reasonably good demand forecasting capacity planning? Anybody? How many people actually forecast their consumption, their resources for uh, for their projects based on historical data? Not many. OK, so this is something that we've been thinking about as well, is talking about predictable verification, is predictable forecasting. And forecasting is a bit of an art form. So if you can do this, and again, this is synthetic data that we've generated, but you could base it on actual data if you collected good data, you can start to look at you know, the profile of a project over time and understand how that fits within your available capacity. And your available capacity may be fixed. You know, you, if you're on-prem, you may have the ability to burst into cloud. Um, so you may, you may have some flexibility. But trying to understand that profile can really help you think about how do you invest in the platforms and the capacity? And you know, how do you make that business case, as Joe was saying, to your board to actually spend the dollars on the on the um, on the resources. I think we, I think we're pretty much there. Joe, do you want to just finish this last slide? I think we're out of time. You can see the base. It's all in. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.
uh, sorry to rush Brian and Joe, but uh, yeah, we we we, 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 we snuck you in as <laughs> the um, but uh, to, to get you that talk, we thought that's an important talk to give as well. So thank you very much to Brian and Joe. 